nucleophiles, electrophiles, and intermediates. So we're going to be studying about in this lesson and kind of these are some of the key players in the organic reaction mechanisms that we're really going to focus on in the next lesson. So we kind of got to identify what what is, you know, what are these nucleophiles? What are these electrophiles? And what do these intermediates often look like so that we can incorporate them into our organic reaction mechanisms? Now, if this is your first time studying with me, my name is Chad. Welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to make science both understandable and maybe even enjoyable. Now, this is my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so we're going to start with nucleophiles and electrophiles. So one of the key steps in a mechanism, it turns out, is what we call nucleophilic attack. And in a nucleophilic attack step, a nucleophile is going to attack, which really means attach, to an electrophile. It's going to form a bond to an electrophile. So these two are the big players here, and a nucleophile is a Lewis base, which is an electron pair donor. It's going to donate the electrons that are going to be used to make the new bond. So, and an electrophile is a Lewis acid, which is an electron pair acceptor. So it's going to have the new bond being made towards it, if you will. And so in this case, we'll find out that your nucleophiles have to, at the very least, have a lone pair of electrons, and they're more reactive when they have a negative charge, as a negative charge will raise the energy of that lone pair of electrons. Now, an electrophile doesn't actually have to have have a positive formal charge, but we'll see that some of the stronger electrophiles do have a positive formal charge. And I'm going to kind of map out what nucleophile, nucleophilic attack looks like here by using an example where the nucleophile is negative and the electrophile is positive, but we'll see examples of both that aren't necessarily charged at all. Now, the way this is going to work is we're going to use this lone pair of electrons on the nucleophile to make a bond to the electrophile. So in the next lesson, we're going to get to what's called arrow pushing. And we use arrows to show where the electrons are going. And in this case, this arrow, what this actually means is that this lone pair of electrons is being used to form a bond to this electrophile. And so if we look at the result here, And obviously this is generic, but what we now have happen is we now have a nucleophile that is now bonded to the electrophile and the two electrons to form that bond were the two electrons donated by the nucleophile. And the electrophile said, thank you very much. I accept your offer to accept your electrons. And so again, your nucleophile is the electron pair donor. Your electrophile is the electron pair acceptor. And again, this is one of four major types of mechanistic steps, this nucleophilic attack, but it is one of the more common types. And so now we've got to spend a little time talking about what makes a good nucleophile and what makes a good electrophile. All right, so here I've got on the board here a couple of nucleophiles, and I've got one that is neutral with no charge, and then I've got one here with a negative charge, and turns out this one that's neutral is a weak nucleophile, whereas this one with a negative charge is a strong nucleophile, and you'll find that this is a, a pretty common delineation. So keep in mind that that negative charge raises the energy of the electrons, which makes bases stronger, but also makes Lewis bases, in this case nucleophiles, stronger and more reactive as well. And what you'll find is that most of your strong nucleophiles are going to have a negative charge, and then most of the nucleophiles that are neutral are going to end up being weak. And it's not a perfect delineation, but it will be rather helpful in predicting whether or not we've got a strong or weak nucleophile. Now, the other side of the coin is that each of these have lone pairs of non-bonding electrons. That's what gives them the ability to even act as a nucleophile to begin with. So in addition to charge, though, we'll learn a little bit later on, the same way we kind of learned some of the rules for uh, predicting and ranking acids and bases and stuff, we'll find out that the size of the atom with the lone pair of electrons and how electronegative it is are both going to play roles with allowing us to predict relative strengths of nucleophiles. It'll be actually very similar to predicting the relative strengths of bases. But this is something that'll have relevance in the next chapter, so we will cover those trends in nucleophile strength there. All right, so now let's take a look at three very common electrophiles. And nucleophiles were a little bit vague. You've got to be like, well, atoms with lone pairs, maybe you have a chance. But electrophiles, we actually have much fewer options and patterns to recognize. And so it turns out one of the common electrophiles is going to be an alkyl halide. So, and typically the halide you're going to find is typically going to be chlorine, bromine, or iodine, but not fluorine usually, as we'll see. So, but the idea is that, you know, chlorine, bromine, and iodine being the conjugate bases of strong acids are really stable as ions all by themselves. And so they can break off so that something else can form a bond to this electrophile. Keep in mind, that's the definition of electrophile. It's an electron pair acceptor accepting some nucleophiles offer to form a 
bond to it. And by being bonded to one of those halogens, chlorine bromine iodine, that halogen could break away, leaving room so that some other nucleophile could bond to this group. So that's what makes an alkyl halide uh, often a good electrophile. Next electrophile we'll take a look at. So it was what we call a carbocation. And a carbocation just means you have a positive charge on a carbon atom. So and these are pretty typical. It's something that'll be a major part of uh, one of the reactions we study in the next chapter. So, and in this case, I've got kind of surrounded by R groups and we'll see there's a trend for how many of these R groups. Generally, R groups stand for carbons, but here we'll find out, you know, in a little bit that depending on how many of these are hydrons versus how many are carbons, we'll see some trends in stability with that here in a little bit. And finally, the other carbonyl we're going to take a look at here. I'm sorry, the other electrophile we'll take a look at here are the carbonyls. And a carbonyl is just a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. So, and that carbon right there has a significant amount of partial positive charge. So it turns out that double bonds are significantly more polar than single bonds. And so this is not just like twice as polar as a carbon oxygen single bond. It turns out it's more than that. The pi electrons are much more polarizable than sigma electrons. And so double and triple bonds tend to be much uh, more polar when they're between atoms of two different electronegativities. And as a result, it turns out this carbon's got a significant amount of partial positive charge. And if somebody comes and makes a bond to him, he can push these electrons up to the oxygen leaving a negative charge on that oxygen, which is not a bad place to put a negative charge if you got to put one somewhere. And so that's what makes him a good electrophile as well. And we'd typically be bonding right to that carbonyl carbon. And pretty much these are the three most common types of electrophiles. Now this carbonyl could be part of like a ketone or an aldehyde or an ester. There are a lot of different functional groups a carbonyl is a part of, but they all follow this general pattern of being a carbonyl. Cool. This is not an exhaustive list of electrophiles, but this will be the three most common by far. We might bring up another, you know, not so commonly used one every once in a blue moon, but by and large, they're going to probably most of the time fall into one of these three categories, as we'll see in the future. All right, so now we're gonna conclude this lesson by looking at three different sorts of carbon intermediates. And again, this is organic chemistry, which is why we're really focusing on carbon here. Now, not all of your intermediates will necessarily have to involve carbon, but I mean, it's organic chemistry, so they typically will. Now, carbon typically is either gonna have a positive formal charge, a negative formal charge, and in certain rarer cases, we'll see that we've got an, uh, a single unpaired electron, which we call a radical or free radical, you might have heard the term, same same diff, when you got this single unpaired electron. And these are our, our, our three kind of standard types of carbon intermediates. And we wanna know some trends for stability in them. So first case here, we've got carbocations here. And in this case, your carbon with a positive formal charge, we can actually, uh, uh, come up with a trend for stability based on how many carbons he's bonded to. So in this case, I've got him bonded to three carbon atoms. We would refer to that as being tertiary. So, and this one here is only bonded to two carbon atoms and one hydrogen that's not drawn in, that would be considered secondary. This one's bonded to one carbon atom and then two hydrogens that are not drawn in, that would be considered primary. And then this carbon's bonded to only three hydrogens, not bonded to any other carbons whatsoever. And we would refer to him as being methyl in this case. So, and it turns out the trend for carbocation stability is that they get more stable as they get what we say more substituted. So tertiary is most substituted, methyl is the least substituted. And what we mean by substituted is that it is bonded to the most carbon substituents. And so in this case, tertiary, the most substituted of the carbocations, turns out is the most stable. And it is no small feat to figure out why in the world that is. So what I'm gonna do is draw this primary carbocation right here and use it kind of as an example to figure out why in the world uh, the tertiary ones are more stable and things of this sort. Because the reason comes down to something we call hyperconjugation. So, and it's not the easiest thing to explain, much more helpful if you got a good picture in front of you. All right, in this case, we've got a carbocation here, and that carbocation having three electron domains would be sp2 hybridized and trigonal planar. And so in this case, I'm gonna try and, instead of drawing it in the plane of the board, I've tried to reflect that I'm actually drawing it in the horizontal plane. This wedge means it's coming right out of the board, and this dash means it's going right into the board, and they're in the horizontal plane. And what you'll find out is that for a carbocation like this, so it's got three sp2 hybrid orbitals, but then it's got an unhybridized p orbital, and that unhybridized p orbital 
So right here in the perpendicular plane. So if these are in the horizontal plane, the p orbital is in the vertical plane, and it's just empty. So for a carbocation. And in this case, on the carbon next door, so if we look at kind of the orbitals involved for being with the carbon next door versus what's going to be going on with the hydrogen right here, what we'll find out is that for this carbon right here, in this case, I'm going to have him be a methyl group. So he's going to be bonded to three hydrogens. So, and if we actually draw the molecular orbitals involved in this case, I'm sorry, the, uh, I'm going to say the atomic orbitals that form the molecular orbital. Let's, we'll do it that way. So here we're going to have an sp3 hybridized uh, orbital. So overlapping with the s orbital of this hydrogen. So actually I will draw it as a molecular orbital. So, and it's the combination of the sp3 from the carbon and the s from the hydrogen forming this molecular orbital right here. And then we'd have another one right here. So on your study guide, I actually show separate orbital. I show the sp3 and the s overlapping, but the truth is they would create a new molecular orbital that is kind of the combination of the two. And so what you find out is happening here is you're actually, these are actually big enough and the p orbital is big enough that they're, it's hard to show it on my picture, but these are actually overlapping sideways. There's even overlap with this one. It's not pointing 180 apart. It's just pointing 109.5, which is hard for me to represent on the board, but you're getting a little bit of overlap with these orbitals. So and the empty p orbital. And what that allows them to do is it allows them to send a little bit of electron density back towards this empty p orbital. That's going to make this carbocation carbon a little less positively charged, and it would make this carbon over next to it a little more positively charged. And so making this carbocation less positive, though, is going to make him more stable. It's going to make him less electron deficient. And so what we've seen here is that the carbon next to him is electron donating, we say. He donates a little bit of electron density, and we call this ability of this sideways overlap between a p orbital and these sp3, uh, or let's just really say these molecular orbitals formed from the sp3 from carbon and the s from hydrogen. So, and this process we call hyperconjugation. Now, the other place you would have seen sideways overlap was the sideways overlap of p orbitals, which forms a pi bond. But those are perfectly parallel. There's a significant amount of pi overlap. These are not perfectly parallel. So, and there's only a little bit of overlap. So it's nowhere near you know, the kind of overlap you see in a pi bond. And so, but it does contribute just a little bit of electron density back to the positive carbon, making it a little more stable. Now, it turns out we don't have that when we're bonded to hydrogens here. So in this case, when this carbon is bonded to a hydrogen, so again, that hydrogen is contributing its s orbital, the carbon's contributing an sp2 in this case, but notice this is not bonded to anything itself that could overlap with these p orbitals. There's no overlap with those p orbitals that's even possible in this sense of hyperconjugation. And so for the carbon, being bonded to hydrogens, that's not any help to him when he's electron deficient. But being bonded to other carbon atoms, that's what's going to help him. And so for the carbocation, being bonded to as many carbons as possible, being the most substituted carbocation, is the most stable. And the reason we give is called, we call it hyperconjugation. And so a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary carbocation. A secondary carbocation is more stable than a primary carbocation. And a primary carbocation is more stable than a methyl carbocation. Now it turns out with radicals, the only difference we'd see here for the radical is there'd be no positive formal charge here. There'd just be a single unpaired electron in that p orbital. Okay, it'd still be sp2 hybridized carbon, but there'd be a single electron there, but it doesn't have a charge. However, there is one perspective where we'd still look at this carbon, even without a positive charge, as being electron deficient because he doesn't have a filled octet. He's got two, four, six, seven electrons around him, not eight. And so in that sense, he's still electron deficient. Well, again, donating a little electron density back towards him gets him closer to having a filled octet, makes him a little more stable. And so it turns out for carbon radicals here that we're going to see the same trend in stability, that tertiaries will be more stable than secondary radicals, secondary radicals more stable than primary radicals, primary radicals more stable than methyl radicals. So again, increasing stability with increasing substitution. The most substituted radical is the most stable radical. Now, if we move on to carbanions here, so turns out carbanions are going to work a little bit different here. In this case, they're not electron deficient like the carbocation or the radical. In this case, their problem is that they have actually too many electrons having a negative formal charge. And so in this case, if they have too many electrons, 
Well, then having carbons next door that are going to be able to donate even more electrons back to them isn't actually going to make them more stable. It actually is going to make them less stable. And so in this case, again, if you're electron deficient, you want to be bonded to as many carbons as you can. But if you're electron rich, like the carbanion is, you want to be bonded to as few carbons as you can. And so in this case, it turns out it's the methyl carbanion that'll be the most stable, then the primary, then the secondary, and then the tertiary. So these will actually get more stable as they get less substituted. And so for carbanions, it is exactly backwards. Cool. And again, that really just comes down to carbocations and radicals are electron deficient and they want to be bonded to as many electron donating carbons as possible to make them more stable. Whereas, elect whereas your carbanions are electron rich, so they want to be bonded to as few carbons as possible, more hydrogens instead. Cool, and these are our three common intermediates we're going to encounter in some of the mechanisms and mechanistic steps we see throughout all of the rest of OCHEM 1 and OCHEM 2. And in this next lesson, we'll start digging into some of these mechanisms and we'll identify the four common, uh, four most common mechanistic steps and we'll start going through the arrow pushing associated with them. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share, a couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. If you're looking for the study guide that went with this lesson, or if you're looking for practice quizzes and practice exams and practice tests and practice final exams for organic chemistry, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.